Adobe Premiere or something like that. But still, the planning stage does require that you have these field guides so that you know exactly what the area that's going to be uh, taken in by the camera is going to be. So it's handy to have something like that set up at some point in time so that, uh, so that you can reference it. Okay, so what we're going to do today, I don't know if you guys watched the video from last week on YouTube, but I completed the animation for both classes where I, in this class I did the, the Daffy Duck, so I cleaned it up and then shot it as a pencil test so you could see it. So I'll, I'll just show you the cleaned up animation here. So here are all my drawings. I'm bouncing up and down. So this is all based exactly on the stuff that I had done in last week's class with our double ball bounce and then adding on that third ball bounce with the hook on the nose. So what we're going to do today is we're going to introduce uh, an overlapping action. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to do a tail. I'm going to do the character's arms on this, the wings, as he flops up and down. But you'll basically do the exact same thing that I'm doing with your double ball. So hopefully you brought your drawings with you and uh, you can follow along with me. And once again, uh, in this class, with this lecture, since I, I try to do something different every year, uh, but still adhere to the same basic theory and principle, um, I'm, not, I'm not doing exactly the, uh, the type of thing that, that you would necessarily do with your double ball, because if I was following along with what I would normally do, I would bring in my two balls, my one, one ball that's down here and the other ball that's here, as my rough animation, and then I would actually animate on top of that, as you guys have to do. But if you want to see that component, that lecture for specifically what it is that you have in your hands with the two balls and adding on the tail, just pop onto YouTube and look for the double ball bounce or go into my website under the, uh, the um, index section and just look for the double ball bounce with a tail. Yep? Well, you're going to have to run fast because I'm starting. Okay, yeah? Is there a way to reduce the brightness? Is there a way to what? To reduce the brightness? Yeah, I tried that. I tried turning off the light over there, but then it's too dark. Like the, the light doesn't show up enough to make the image show up. So we're gonna have to stick with what you got. I mean, you could move up a little bit closer. I don't know. Can everybody see? Okay, half decently okay. What's going on on screen? Everybody's all right. Sort of. You can come close. Can you guys in the front see? Okay. Sort of. Not really. Well, let me try it with the light out and see if anybody's happy with that. Because it may, it may end up being too dark to see it. Is that better? Yeah? Okay. Right. And what I'll do is when I transfer it over to the video, I'll just pump up the brightness on it. Okay. So, uh, if you remember how we did the, uh, the, the secondary ball when we did it last week, um, we had to plan out what the action was going to be based on the fastest part of the movement so that we could calculate where that position of the ball was going to be based on the rate that the other ball was dropping. So we figured that it was drawing number five that we were going to start with because that was when the ball was dropping fastest so we could assume that the top ball was stretched out and then we just straight ahead animated all the way through. So we're going to do exactly the same type of thing on this one here. We're going to go to drawing number five first. So take out your drawing number five. have here we know that this part of the ball down here was moving its fastest rate this part here we stretched out in order to get it to pull and uh, when we had it on the extra ball on top here we stretched it out even further and had the line coming down so what I'm going to do on this one and you can do the same basic thing is I'm going to add the arms onto the character or his wings so in this case here I'm attaching them to the second ball if you want to attach them to your second ball you can if you want to you can make it the tail down here <coughs> and attach it to the first ball, completely up to you as to where you want to put it. But basically you want to draw a line that looks like this. So we're actually connecting it to one of the balls and then we're just looping it and pulling it so it's dragging straight up like this. Okay, maximum pull, everything's being pulled down, so therefore 
the tail, or in this case my arm, is just going to be dragging straight above. Now, I'm going to do this at the same time. I'm going to put the other arm on here. So if you want to put two lines on there, you can. So I'd put my other arm in behind here and stretching up like that. It would go in behind his head and possibly the tip would be sticking out. Now I'm just going to draw a single line for this all the way through, which is what you guys will be doing as well for yours. But then you can modify it and change it into whatever you want. So if you want to turn it into a tail, you can just add more volume onto it. So rather than having just a single line that looks like this, if you want to, you can add a volume so it turns into like a rat tail like this over on this side. You see that okay? Um, or if I had a line that was like this, I could make it bushy like that or fluff it up any way you want. If you want to turn it into like a, a lion's tail, you can make it thin here and put a little knot of hair on the back end of it like that. All right? Completely up to you as to how you want to uh, approach this, but basically we're just looking for that primary line of action that's running through the part that's being pulled on the, on the character. So then we go to drawing number six, which essentially is going to be the same thing because we can see here between the two drawings, the only difference between these two is that we have a little bit more of a stretch on the head. And I have, I have expanded the character's head out a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to shift so that I'm looking for a marker. And in your case, depending on where it is that you're placing your tail, if you're going to put it on the second stretchy ball, then line it up so that the connection point, whatever that connection point is that you've chosen, let's say your stretchy ball looks like this, you're looking for a marker point that you're going to place the, the tail on. What's the connection point? Like where does it come out of the character's body? So if in this case, like let's say uh, you've got the two balls and the one ball is down here like this, which represents the character's hips, and this line here represents the character's upper body, then this would be the shoulder point. Okay, so now what you're doing is you're anatomically connecting this line and giving it, making a statement saying that this is an arm and therefore this part here is attached to the shoulder. And where on this second ball, if this represents a chest mass, where would that be attached? And just be consistent with it all the way through. So if I was going to put a tail on the character, then I'd say here's the character's hips, pelvic girdle, and the tail's going to come out of the butt on the side like this. Right? as opposed to putting the tail coming out of here. Because most animals don't have tails coming out of the middle of their spine, out of the middle of their back. It comes out from their butt. Right? So if you wanted to, you could even wrap it around the bottom line of the character's butt like that. Okay? So you choose the anchor point and actually assign it as to what it is. And then just be consistent with it. So when I place this over top of here, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a landmark on the character that I can use to say, Here's something consistent. So as you can see with Daffy Duck, he's got that ring around his neck. So I'm going to use that as my marker. I'm going to place this point over top of that and then attach the shoulder to that same point there. And keep the line moving in the exact same way. I might put a little bit of a stretch on it because again between these two you can see that if I line up the butt, how much his head is stretching up there to create more of a pull. So if I'm going to pull one part of the body, I really should pull another part of the body that's dragging at the same time. Right? Here's where we get into logistical you know, physics of the character. And basically, you're making up the rules as you go along. You're saying, how stretchy is this character? Okay. Can my character stretch more than this? Possibly, if I wanted him to. But would, be, would it be appropriate for the action that's taking place is the other question that I then have to ask. Is it pushing it too far? Is it making it too cartoony? Does it stretch the limits of believability for this character? Does it follow through with the timing that's taking place in this action? Right? These are all things that you have to sort of consider as you're moving through your drawings. And this is back to that basic uh, principle that I've always been touting, is that you've got to be thinking about what you're doing as you're drawing. If you're not thinking, then you're just mindlessly doodling, and you're making it up without any rules or regulations to it, or cause and effect, then chances are the outcome of what you're trying to do may not be as effective as what you want it to be. So now in this drawing here, you can see that the difference between these two is that my chest is coming down and forward. See how the, the path of action on the head is curving a little bit here? So what's happening is there's a little bit of a compression between the chest and the head, but there's also an arcing movement on the forward part of the chest. So there's a pivot point 
here where the spine is now bending over this way because the impact is hit down and therefore the head is starting to fall forward. So therefore I want to make sure that that connection point with the shoulders is the same and it's still following through with the path of action with the understanding that if the shoulders start to pull forward like that, that I've got to follow through with it. But the length of the arm is such that it's basically going to blend in with the previous line that I've drawn. So here's where we're getting into that theory of the gymnast with the ribbon on the end of the pole. Wherever that tip of the pole goes, whatever path of action it creates, whatever figure it creates, so if I do a figure eight like this, the ribbon has to follow that exact same figure eight pattern. It can't deviate off of it. Okay, if it does, then it starts to look like it's got a mind of its own. And that's not something that we necessarily want to have happen because this is just dragging. So we want to follow through that line there with the arm coming down like this and then we move on to drawing, in my case I've got the 7A drawing which is the favor right after the compression. You may or may not have put this drawing in. So if you haven't put it in then don't worry about it. If you have put it in then you have to consider what you're going to do with it. So in this case here you'll remember that there's the compression of your main ball and this part here is still stretching but it's sort of impacting on it. Remember we did that little saucer thing where I had the suction cup on top of it, but this part here was still stretching up. Now in this one, we have the reversal where the bottom ball is going up, so now I've taken the upper part of his body and compressed it down, and I'm dragging the top part of his head down as well. So because of that, his shoulder has now moved into this position here, and it's basically locked out now. See how it stopped at that point? Okay, and that's okay, you can do that, but then you have to consider what's the rest of his arm going to be doing. So as the arm comes down like this, what I want it to do is I want it to continue down as his shoulder stops and begins to go back up again so that I overlap and pivot it like this. Right? So what I'm doing is I'm taking the shoulder point here and freezing it but continuing the downward action of the arms but bending it severely. So basically I'm following my path of action that was coming down like this but I'm going to pull it out like this. So it's going to wrap like that. So now it looks like this part here is still coming down, the tip is still coming down, but the shoulder is stopped. So here's where we're into our definition of what is overlapping action. Not everything happens at the same time. Okay? Now this is also a form of what's called secondary action. It's happening secondary to the primary action. So this is actually tertiary action if you want to call it because our primary action is the first ball, our secondary action is the second ball in his chest, and the third part is this part here. Right. So while the bottom ball is going up, the second ball is also going up but it's being compressed down, the top part, the tip of the finger on his wing is still on its way down. Right. So everything else is starting to go back up again but the tip of the finger is still coming down and we're going to continue to make it come down even while everything else continues to go up. So in your next drawing, number eight, which is now the middle ball, or the, the bottom ball was on its way halfway back up again. Okay. Here's where my shoulder is now going to be here, in this position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow my line of action, my path of action coming down through here, and I'm going to bend this part of the arm so it's pulling down in this direction here, but flip the hand so it's curling back up. So this part here, the tip of the finger, is still on its way down, while this part, the shoulder, and here, is on its way back up again. So it gets a curling action like this. So if we consider the different parts of the arm here, this is the shoulder, we could say this point right here is the elbow, this point here would be the wrist, and this point here would be the fingertip. So on this one here, there's my shoulder, here's my elbow, here's my wrist, and here's my fingertip. So in this drawing here, my elbow is here still up. Now it's looped and it's coming back up again. So on that previous one it was going down, now it's going up. The wrist is still going down and the fingertips are still going down. So elbow and shoulders are going up, wrist and fingertip are going down. So again, the overlapping action element to it. Now when I go to my number nine drawing, 
Everything's going up, including the head now. Head's going up. I find my connection point for the shoulder, but I also have to consider again, what are the physics, the, the effects that are taking place on the body. So we know that the shoulders are basically set up like this. You've got the center of your, your chest, where your clavicles meet, right here, okay, right at the base of your neck. That's a point where my two fingers meet. Then we've got our clavicles that are basically these little wings that go out like this. And then there's the shoulder point, and then down to your wrist, or elbow and wrist. Okay. So when your character is going to bounce back up like this, we're going to get this pull in the clavicle that's going to cause the shoulders to drop down. So if I look at the shoulders and where I place them on this one here, I could pull those shoulders down further on the character's body here to get more of a sense of pull. So I'm looking for my line of action that I've created through here on the way back up again to where the shoulder is, and it's being pulled back up here. So I follow that line of action down, and I'm going to curl just a little bit of the fingertips here, like this. So I'm continuing that overlapping action where this part of the fingertip right here, I could push a little bit further, is still on its way down while everything else, the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder, shoulder, elbow, wrist, are all now on their way back up again. So I'm getting a cascading action effect. And it's just another term for overlapping action. Not everything's happening at the same time. Not everything goes in the same direction at the same time. So now when my character comes into this position here, here's where I can reverse the curve on the arm, like this, and I could do one of two different things, depending on how I want this to happen. The tip of the finger on this drawing here is out here. So eventually it's going to come back up. Now, because of the nature of the character, it's a bird, and he's got wings. So if I want to, what I could do is I could continue this curve going out this way to create a crack whip type feel, where the fingers go snap on that end, and then they pull up. Or what I could do is I could form a figure S here and just curve this line down this direction here to take the snap away at this point and make it more soft. It just depends on how you want the effect to go. Okay. So if you want to, you can follow your path of action from where you had it previously like this, or just do a little snap and make it curve in that direction. I'll leave that up to you. So number 11 now is coming up into my high point. Here's where my arms are going to start to relax a little bit. So I'm going to find my shoulder, start to raise the shoulder up a little bit higher. So this is just a connection point. And I'm going to start to release the energy here on my arm, pulling it out in this direction here. So I want my curve to come like this. Okay. Pulling it up. And then I go to number one, which is now my high point, my key drawing for the bottom ball. So again, I'm going to take my shoulder, and I actually drew a little oval there from the original drawing to figure out where it was going to be. So I'm going to continue to release the energy now on the arm here and start to bowl the arm out. And I don't know if you're noticing, but it's very similar to what I did with the neck in the third ball of the head here the actions are pretty much the same. See how there's the drag there, the drag being pulled down. This one here, how it comes down like this, and there's that curvature that's going here, which is the same as the curvature that's going there, just in the opposite direction. Back up on this one, see the curvature here, and the curvature here. See the same, same lines of action running through it. So what I did with this one here, I'm doing basically the same thing on the opposite side. It's just I have to change it ever so slightly to reflect what that part of the body is, because the head is not necessarily going to act the same way as the arms and the fingers are. So. so I'm starting to release that energy, pull the arm out like this, and then go to my number two drawing where once again everything's starting to come down except for the shoulder. Remember I locked the shoulder out here, and in your case you may have put the pin in the top of that second ball and made it hold at that position. So this part here has locked out on me, but I'm going to start to open it even more out here. So it comes to that position. And now on this next drawing, number three, I think this is, 
can't remember what I did here. I think I did drop the shoulder just slightly here. Yeah, see so it's dropping just slightly. So therefore I'm going to have this part go down a little bit, continue my elbow up, got this type of an action here. So if I take and do a stack roll where I put each drawing in between each of my fingers here, I can see the sequence of events on those last five drawings to see whether or not it's doing what I want it to do. Now I need to take my bottom drawing off which is number five here because basically what I have to do at this point is I have to in between between number three and five to get my number four correct. So I've got to go from here to here. So this is the tricky part because there was the favor on the upper part of the, the body here going from this one to this one here. There's very little movement in that top part. I'm making this drag even further. So yeah, my shoulder's coming down here and the rest of it's got to be going up. I'm just going to repeat what I did on the opposite side where I'm going to take, take the fingertip and keep it going down but get everything else in this drawing here going down now. And that should then link into this one here. It comes like that. Now I do have to make a little modification to my number five drawing in order to make it blend in. So I'm just going to take number three, put four over top so they're going in sequence. Put number five down and just when I roll flip it, like this, you'll see how it snaps just a little bit too hard there and this part here reverses a little bit, which is okay, there's nothing wrong with that part of it. I think what I would want to do is I just want to take this line here and maybe just pull it inward and then reverse the curve on it so it's doing this instead. So it, it'll blend in nicer with the previous drawing. So that feels a little bit nicer there, having it curved down that way. And then when I go to my number six drawing here, that's when it begins to straighten out. So I'm okay with that. So let's take it all off the pegs now and do my stack flip here. You can see how it has a nice flow to it. Almost looks like he's flapping his wings to a certain extent. Okay. So all that's remaining now is for me to just add on the volume and the detail to it. 